On February 6th, two powerful earthquakes struck south-central Turkey and northern Syria. The damage was especially catastrophic in the Turkish city of Antakya, where thousands of lives were lost and more than three-quarters of all buildings were damaged beyond repair. Fifteen centuries ago, Antakya was Antioch, one of the most important cities in the Roman world. It was here that the emperors staged their campaigns against the Persians. Here that the followers of Jesus were first called Christians. And here, again and again, that earthquakes caused devastation reminiscent of last month's disaster. In 115 AD, while the emperor Trajan was visiting the city, Antioch was leveled by an earthquake with an estimated magnitude of 7.5. The devastation seems to have been almost total. Archaeologists found the disaster marked by a thick layer of rubble upon which new streets were constructed. Although a Roman consul traveling with Trajan was killed, the emperor himself escaped by crawling out a window. For several days, as aftershocks rattled the city, the imperial retinue was forced to camp in the open racetrack of the Hippodrome. Four centuries later, in 526, an even more devastating earthquake tore Antioch apart, reportedly killing 250,000 people. Fires raged over the rubble, destroying almost everything spared by the tremors. The city's vast octagonal cathedral, begun by Constantine, was one of the last buildings to burn. Many pages of classical history were torn by earthquakes. In 464 BC, a severe earthquake struck Sparta, killing so many citizens that the helots, Sparta's repressed serf class, seized the opportunity to rise in rebellion. It took the Spartans years to put down the uprising, and the political fallout contributed to the tension between Athens and Sparta that culminated, a generation later, in the Peloponnesian War. In 373 BC, a tsunami and earthquake destroyed the Greek city of Helice, leaving many buildings underwater. The submerged ruins became a tourist attraction and may have inspired Plato's telling of the story of Atlantis, inundated by a terrible disaster. A century and a half later, an earthquake snapped the Colossus of Rhodes, the gargantuan bronze statue famous as a wonder of the world, at the knees, leaving a pile of shattered limbs that would dominate the city's harbor for eight centuries. The most destructive of all classical earthquakes took place in 365 AD. Centered near Crete, where parts of the coast were uplifted by 30 feet, this tremor sent tsunamis roaring across the Mediterranean. The whole harbor district of Alexandria was destroyed, along with, according to some scholars, the famous library and the tomb of Alexander the Great. Years later, ships could still be found miles inland where the tsunami had swept them. Some of the most iconic classical sites were shaped by earthquakes. In the Roman Forum, the ancient frescoes of Santa Maria Antiqua were preserved by landslides triggered by a 9th century earthquake. At Scythopolis, Beit Shean in modern Israel, visitors can still see the broken columns of the arcades along the Roman city's main street, still lying where an earthquake felled them. Visitors to the ancient Greek city of Salinas, modern Salonute in western Sicily, can clamor over the shattered columns of a colossal temple reduced to ruins by a medieval earthquake. At Pompeii, finally, Traces of the earthquake that rattled the city 17 years before the eruption of Vesuvius are visible everywhere. The Temple of Jupiter overlooking the city's forum, for example, was still under restoration at the time of the eruption. The Temple of Isis, likewise, had just been reconstructed when it was buried by volcanic debris. Two reliefs discovered in the atrium of the house of Lucius Caecilius Eucundus show the form of Pompeii mid-quake the buildings leaning and collapsing. The Mediterranean owes its seismic volatility to the vagaries of plate tectonics. For millions of years, the African and Eurasian plates have been colliding along and beneath the Mediterranean Sea, pushing up mountain chains, sparking volcanoes, and generating earthquakes at their points of contact. Several minor plates, the Aegean, Anatolian, and Arabian, complicate and multiply the fault lines. Lacking anything like a theory of plate tectonics, the Greeks and Romans attributed seismic activity to Poseidon, 
god of the sea, who was known as the Earthshaker from the time of the Homeric epics onward. To stay the god's wrath, sacrifices were made and hymns raised to Poseidon as restrainer of the earth and the stabilizer. During the early 4th century BC, an earthquake struck the day after a Spartan army marched into the territory of a neighboring city. To appease Poseidon, the officers and men sang a hymn for the god. Some of the soldiers, regarding the quake as a sign of divine disapproval, wanted to retreat. But the Spartan king, reasoning that an earthquake was at least as likely to be a sign of approbation, simply sacrificed to Poseidon and continued forward. After the classical world became Christian, earthquakes continued to be interpreted as signs of divine wrath. Jesus himself, after all, had said that earthquakes would presage the end of days. The liturgy of the Greek Orthodox Church still marks the anniversaries of seven ancient earthquakes. Over the centuries, ancient scholars produced a wide range of proto-scientific theories about the causes of earthquakes. Thales, the first Greek philosopher, believed that the earth floated in a universal sea whose motions were felt as tremors. Anaximenes, another early philosopher, proposed that variations in the wetness of the soil produced subterranean cracks, contractions, and convulsions. Anaxagoras thought that earthquakes were caused by ether effervescing upward, Democritus by rainwater percolating downward. Aristotle declared that earthquakes could only be generated by winds entering the earth. Centuries later, the Roman philosopher Seneca, inspired by the recent tremor at Pompeii, wrote an entire book on the subject of earthquakes. After dismissing the idea that the gods were responsible and reviewing various hypotheses, he endorsed a Stoic variant of Aristotle's explanation. Currents of air flowed through cavities in the earth, producing earthquakes wherever they were obstructed. Whatever their opinions on the causes of earthquakes, the Greeks and Romans knew from experience how devastating their effects could be. Although cities stricken by earthquakes could expect nothing in the way of immediate medical assistance, they could and did appeal for help in rebuilding. In the wake of an earthquake that rattled the province of Asia, for example, Tiberius sent relief funds to the hardest-hit places and excused other afflicted cities from direct taxation. During the 2nd century, likewise, when the city of Smyrna was damaged by an earthquake, Aelius Aristides, a famous orator, immediately sent an appeal to Marcus Aurelius for financial assistance. Despite his many other obligations, including his ruinously expensive wars with the Quadi and Marcomanni, Marcus obliged. Perhaps the most impressive example of ancient disaster relief followed the terrible earthquake of 526, which, along with a subsequent sack by the Persians, completely destroyed Antioch. With a vast infusion of imperial funds, Justinian reconstructed the entire city, walls, houses, streets, and churches, making special provision for the health and security of the residents. Now, 1,500 years later, Antioch, Antakya, needs to be rebuilt again, along with many other cities and towns in Turkey and Syria. I hope that you'll consider using the link on screen to donate to Direct Relief, a charity currently providing emergency medical assistance to victims of the recent earthquake and dedicated more generally to alleviating the effects of disasters and poverty worldwide. If you're interested in more Toldenstone content, including my podcast, check out my channel, Toldenstone Footnotes. I also have a channel called Scenic Roots of the Past, which is dedicated to historically themed travel. You'll find both channels linked in the description. Please consider joining other viewers in supporting Tolden Stone on Patreon. You might also enjoy my book, Naked Statues, Fat Gladiators, and War Elephants. Thanks for watching.